Oh, there. Got a great topic for you tonight. Same one that the kids are talking about. And that is the sacraments, the way that Jesus wants to stay close to us in the here and the now. And like uh, the different types of sacraments we got, I'll cover our uh, varying de degrees of depth. We've got the sacraments of initiation, sacraments of healing, sacraments of service. I'm going to go ahead and start with our prayer, as we've been doing with a scripture passage. So I'll just go ahead and read that one and uh, just take a short moment to reflect on if anything stands out to you or why might that have meaning or why it stands out to you is always something good to think about when we uh, read scripture. That's not from the Bible. Anyway, uh, here it is from Luke 24, 13 to 32. It's the setting is shortly after Jesus died. And it goes, Now, that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? They said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who is the prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we are hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses... And all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on further. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So they went in to stay with him. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he broke bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to him. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scripture to us? So in that moment that the disciples were dejected after Jesus died, Jesus walks with them. They don't recognize his presence. And I think it's kind of a nice analogy for sometimes in our own lives where we don't see how God fits in with what's going on in our lives. And that's just kind of why I put that uh, poem in there uh, called Footprints. I remember when I was like uh, 22 or 23, I was working, had an apartment, I was like, I should like hang something on the wall because I don't have anything on the wall and people seem to do that. So I went to Goodwill because I don't care that much and uh, picked up this footprints in the sand. 
thing and eight by 11 is probably like two bucks. And for some reason I noticed I still had it. Um, I always kind of thought that was uh, a nice little poem just showing how Jesus can carry us when uh, the ships are down, when we don't realize that he's doing it. And then along with that uh, scripture passage that I read, within that you can kind of see the mass. So you have scripture. Jesus opens our minds to understand the scripture, what's in the Old Testament that led up to him, predicts him in the Psalms, the law, the prophets. And then what do they do? He says the blessing, breaks bread, they see him, then he just uh, disappears. So with that scripture reading, it show, shows Jesus' journey with us in, in the church. He does that within his presence that he left with us, that being his presence in the sacraments. So that sacraments are visible and they give us grace. So each person has a body and a soul, so God wants to communicate with things that we can see, hear, taste, touch, <clears throat> smell, and then it also has that divine grace within it. So a sacrament, the technical definition of a sacrament is an efficacious sign of grace instituted by Christ and trust of the church by which divine life is given to us. So when you say a sacrament is an efficacious sign, efficacious means that it produces the intended result. A sign, we say sign because our sacraments point to something deeper. Someone who walked into mass uh, not knowing what they're seeing, they see some bread and wine and a priest pray over them. That might have absolutely no meaning to them. All they see is the bread and the wine. And because of uh, Jesus doing that at the Last Supper and telling us to do that in memory of him, there's a deep something deeper going on right there and like it's like that with uh, each sacrament. So what the sacraments do is it give us grace, they connect us to Christ, grace is God's help within our lives, and they are entrusted to the church. So uh, one of uh, the sayings about the church is I'm basically just a uh, servant to the church and serving to what Christ left us. We're just here to take care of what he gave us and pass it on to uh, others. That's why like the Pope, bishops, priests, we don't have the authority to change the sacraments. I can't walk into Mass and have uh, peace on past blue ribbon on the altar. It won't be the Eucharist because Jesus used certain elements, bread and wine, plus all the old ladies who get extremely angry with me. <laughs> Along with everybody else, the bishop would find out, and then I'd have to take a vacation. <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, the technical part of uh, sacraments. So the more we experience the sacraments, the more we experience Jesus in our midst, Jesus uh, with us, and that's where we encounter the living Jesus right now. So you have the, sac the sacraments of initiation. Has anybody ever experienced initiation into anything? I have once that I can remember. It was a lacrosse team. It involved beer. <laughs> running around a lacrosse stick with your head down like 20 times, running down a field and back, and then getting a goofy haircut. And then I had to give a speech the next day with that goofy haircut. And I believe I did a very poor job. Luckily, the sacraments of initiation are not like that. Like right now, that to me just looks like too much work. So the, sac the first sacrament of initiation is baptism. So if sometimes adults want to be baptized and I get to instruct them in the faith. Uh, a lot of times we got uh, children, babies being baptized. It's a great day to uh, have a baptism whenever I have one. And uh, through our baptism, 
were initiated, initiated into the church family, become a part of the body of Christ. And the nice thing is, there's nothing we can do to earn that, earn the sacrament of baptism. And uh, the other good news is if someone thinks you're not worthy of God, the good news is nobody is. So we don't have to worry about that. And uh, got through uh, adults being educated, obviously that's an effort. And then with the parents having their kid, their back babies or young children baptized, they're the ones who make the baptismal promises for the kids that adults make. So that's why, like when I, we had the baptismal promises that go, you know, do you reject Satan? Do you believe in God? You guys all say, I do. You're making that profession of faith for your child, and early in the sac, and early in the ceremony, there's that one question about raising the child in the faith and passing on the, the uh, faith for them. So there's uh, effects to receiving the sacraments. There's also the fact that Jesus instituted all the sacraments. So you look at uh, <coughs> baptism. Two places in the Bible point to that one is the baptism of Jesus. In the Jordan, you see uh, Jesus, uh, the Father, opens up the heavens. He says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. And then you have the Holy Spirit come down in the form of death. So the, whole, the early church fathers always told, taught that Jesus, through Jesus' baptism, the waters of baptism are blessed. And then at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he says to the apostles, Go teach and baptize the nations. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. we got the Trinity right there when Jesus tells the apostles. So we receive sanctifying grace at our baptism. So I, I might have mentioned sanctifying grace in the past. That just means union with God. So sanctifying grace was lost in the Garden of Eden through original sin. Human, sanctifying grace was not to return until Jesus gave us the gift of baptism. So that's union with God. So we got a double mark on our soul. It's fine to hear ESPN use church words like the Immaculate Reception. <coughs> Sometimes if I've seen it where if a guy gets hit really hard in football and hockey, so they just say they'll believe in a double mark. Uh, what the double mark on our soul is, is something that we cannot remove. We're identified as a daughter or son of God with that indelible mark. We receive the theological virtues at baptism, that's those. Faith, which is belief in God. It's also a belief in what God revealed to us in the Bible and in the creed. You have hope, that's trust in God, also hope in heaven. Charity, when you hear charity, it's referring to two things. It's in the Catholic sense of the word, it's referring to love of God and love of neighbor. So then we also receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This word, oh, draw what? Wrong one there, too. That word, filial, that just means uh, looking at God as our Father. So awe of God and filial, feel. Fear of God just means, just like we wouldn't want to disappoint our uh, parents, we don't want to disappoint God. One of these words is usually prudence. I like that word better, because that's the ability to make good decisions. Sometimes, you know, you got different translations. I kind of look at that like, uh, it's kind of a nice thing to receive from God. It's nice when it takes place earlier than <laughs> Fruits of the Holy Spirit. So we receive a lot at our baptism and those graces from God. Next one, second sacrament of initiation is confirmation. And that's where the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, all the grace that we receive at our baptism is strengthened 
and seal the confirmation receive the gift of the Holy Spirit if we're united closer to Christ and then we're also given the grace to be what in the old school world words would be soldiers of Christ standing up for Christ also being willing to put ourselves on the line for Christ the scripture passage having to do or relating to confirmation is Pentecost, where the, where the apostles, the Blessed Virgin Mary, received the gift of the Holy Spirit in the upper room. After Jesus died, 50 days after he died, 10 days after the ascension, they received the Holy Spirit in the form of tongues of fire. <clears throat> Third sacrament of initiation is the Eucharist. So that's uh, what we got uh, Saturday night. And Sunday, celebrate weekdays with uh, the people that are able to go on weekdays. Two aspects of the Eucharist. One is sacrament. The other is sacrifice. So we have the scripture reference to the Eucharist would be the Last Supper that we have in the Gospel. Uh, the words of institution, meaning uh, the words the priest says for the Eucharist. Uh, that's in the Gospel and also within St. Paul writing about it. So the sacrifice part of it, anticipating Jesus' death, he has the Last Supper on the Passover, he changes the Passover meal, takes the bread, this is my body given up for you, do this in memory of me, takes the cup with the wine in it, this is my blood given up for you, blood of the new covenant, do this in memory of me. So he also said the shed for the forgiveness of sin. So that's where the sacrifice of uh, Jesus comes in. Every single Mass, we're celebrating his passion, death, and resurrection. The sacrament part comes in is where we get to receive it, receiving the body and blood of Christ. So we receive great grace in receiving the body and blood of Christ. We uh, have always held that within the body and blood, we have the real presence of Jesus in sacramental form. So we receive forgiveness for venial sins, the smaller ones. The Eucharist unites us to Christ and increases charity within us, love of God and love of neighbor. So just take a brief moment and uh, pause. And maybe if you guys can maybe just, uh, go in <coughs> groups of two or three and just discuss like two or three of these questions that interest you. And let's take a five minute pause, thanks. Hey there, thanks. I'm just gonna uh, go into a couple more things and uh, wrap up. So, as you can see, I'm kind of doing like this is the precise exactly what each sacrament is. I could talk for an hour on each one, but I just want to give you the, the main gist of each uh, one. So one other uh, scripture reference to the Eucharist, I'll move on from the Eucharist, is in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, where Jesus says, Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have eternal life. So it's kind of a uh, nice saying for the Eucharist there. Next two are the sacraments of healing. So we see Jesus heal many people in his ministry in the Gospels, and Jesus wants his healing ministry to continue, and he passed that healing ministry on to the apostles through the sacrament of ordination. So then that sacrament of ordination passed on through all these years. And the healing ministry has continued through all these years. So one sacrament of healing is, we call it reconciliation, which is a nice name. Obviously being reconciled to God, or we call it uh, confession. So that's, some people look at it as a uh, difficult sacrament to go to. Everybody has different experiences. I know for myself, I went to confession in second grade. For some reason, it was in like a darker chapel. And 
I never went until I was like 22 or something. Then I go to profession. It was never really promoted. I was never told to, and I just uh, must have read it in the bulletin or something at some point. Thought, yeah, that's a good idea. And some people may have been raised differently, where they went more often. Um, but anyway, I think I've talked about reconciliation in the past a little bit. And one way to prepare for the sacrament of reconciliation is we talked about like doing a uh, examen of conscience. This is just something people could do at night, just examining the day. And some, if something came up off of that, or if like, oh, I could maybe go to confession for that, maybe receive some uh, forgiveness. Another way to prepare for confirmation is I, I put a little pamphlet on uh, those packets on the sacrament of confession. It's got the simple steps of confession. Each grade, they got like a different little piece of paper to help them, you know, more tailored for their age level. And this one has an exam and a conscience based on the Ten Commandments. Talks about how to go to confession, start the sign of the cross, bless me five, for I've sinned, it's been since my last confession, uh, stay with like to confess, Priest the signs of penance, say the act of contrition out loud, which is in there. Receive uh, absolution, which is the prayer where your sins are uh, forgiven. In the scripture where you hear about uh, this particular sacrament of uh, forgiveness is when Jesus tells the apostles, whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven them. And we also see Jesus forgive people's sins by telling them your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. So, so you have one way to look at confession is just through the daily examine. Another one is through using a pamphlet to help out. Another way is, is there, is there anything weighing on our heart or soul where we would like to receive forgiveness from God? And uh, so it's always just an open invite um, to go to confession and feel like that's something, uh, you know, that would be, uh, you'd want to do. So sin is a, and it's a fancy God. It can at times break our relationship with God if it's mortal sin. Uh, we lose sanctifying grace, which I mentioned is union with God, and that's restored through the sacrament of confession. So also sin can definitely also damage our relationship with people in our lives and confession is a way also receiving forgiveness we receive grace to help us to go sin more, no more and uh, change vice into virtue over time that can be at times uh, difficult but with God's help it's definitely possible also confession can be a healing experience some people just feel some healing from receiving that sacrament it's not always a feeling. Sometimes people don't feel anything, which is fine. But sometimes that sense of uh, healing and sense of uh, trust in those words of absolution where you hear that your sins are forgiven, go in peace, um, that can uh, bring some good connection with God right there. Last, The second and last sacrament of healing is anointing of the sick. And that's a uh, sacrament where I do that and help with that sacrament quite often. So sometimes a person might approach me and say, I'm having a surgery. Can you pray with me? And I'll say, would you like to receive anointing for help with their surgery? Or they might just say, I'm having surgery. Can you give me anointing, and there's a special prayer to pray with that, uh, for that surgery. Then I got, uh, I visit people in the hospital, and sometimes I just offer it to them if they would like it or not. Um, then you have, like, this last week, got a couple different calls, and uh, the person is imminently going to pass away. So that's where I use some different prayers. You might have heard it called last rites. So like 
anointing of the sick and last rites is the same sacrament. There's just different prayers used for each. So, like, when I moved here, like most priests, I make sure there's a, there's a landline next to my head, next to the bed. So like last week, you get a call at 11 o'clock at night, I was about to fall asleep, 25 below, you go, right? And you're like, ah, oh, whatever. I'm like, that's why I keep a phone by my head. And then uh, they feel guilty or something. And the person died that night at like 2 a.m. I went in on Monday, the person passed away today. And uh, so, I mean, that's uh, kind of the reality of that uh, sacrament is it's something that people want and desire if they know about it. And it's a sacrament that gives them some really good grace at that moment in their lives. So some of the effects of the sacrament of healing would be uh, sometimes actual healing. Sometimes we receive uh, grace from God, comfort within our soul. Maybe it'll increase our trust in God. It can also uh, grant forgiveness through that sacrament. It strengthens us. We're given a closer union with Christ, especially to Jesus in his passion and redemptive sufferings. So on the cross, Jesus redeemed us, meaning freeing us from sin, giving us eternal life. And St. Paul said that we can share in the redemptive suffering of Christ through offering our suffering to Christ. So we're united to Christ. Redemptive suffering, a nice way to put it would be... Uh, you know, for suffering from something, you know, Jesus, I offer this suffering and unite it to, the, to your suffering on the cross for this particular person or prayer or uh, prayer intention. And uh, it's a very powerful prayer. Sometimes I talk with people, sometimes it's, I can tell it's not the time to bring that up to uh, somebody. But it's a great way to um, get grant meeting to our suffering. Lastly, anointing the sick gives us strength for our final journey. You know, on our way out, strengthen the soul. And there's two scripture spots for uh, anointing the sick would be the Gospel of Luke, where it talks about the apostles going and anointing those who are sick or suffering with oil, and they receive healing. The other part is from the letter of St. James, which I repeat when I go out for anointing, where it talks about uh, if someone is sick or suffering, send for priests to the church, and the priest will pray over them, anointed with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, the Lord will raise them up. If they have too many sins, their sins will be forgiven them. So that's right from the scripture and the letter of uh, James. Last two sacraments of the sacraments of service, holy matrimony, holy orders, both of which were actually on for the same responsibilities, just in a different way. So you look at, uh, we're both on for dedicating ourselves to the salvation of others. So that would be your spouses and kids, and people in our lives, that would be the people I serve through the ministry that I do, dedicate myself to the salvation of others. So answering uh, God's call can bring us uh, fulfillment in our lives. So it doesn't hurt to maybe uh, you know, help your child learn about prayer through also directing their actions towards God a little bit. So like if they're trying to decide what they'd like to do with their life, maybe at some point, just ask them, have you asked God what he would like you to do with your life? That's, that's where we're going to find our deepest fulfillment, contentment, and happiness is when we're doing what God is calling us to do and serving him or up there uh, interested in uh, marriage. We may even talk about uh, praying for their future spouse and uh, marrying the person that God would like them to and find the most fulfillment with. You can also promote vocations, priesthood, or religious life, religious sisters. It's a great thing to do. And then uh, lastly, I'm just going to mention a saint. Saint Ignatius of Loyola. He's the founder of the Jesuit 
which, which is uh, an order of priests, either the largest religious order for quite a while. And uh, he was born in the 1400s in Spain. But the interesting part about his story is how he got on the trajectory towards serving Christ and becoming a saint. He wanted to be a soldier and he wanted glory. You know, worldly glory to doing great things as a soldier. He gets hit in the leg with a cannonball and uh, they set his leg once and they didn't set it right. So they had to break it and set it again. And he asked for some books to read, hoping that he'd get, you know, like books about what he's doing, soldiers, knights, earthly glory. And what did they give him? A Bible and a book of the lives of the saints. So when you're stuck in bed in the 1400s, you're not watching Trailer Park Boys and Netflix for like 18 hours. So he actually was reading the scripture, reading about the saints, read about St. Francis. And when he thought about going back to, to being a soldier, he felt what he would call desolation, meaning emptiness. And when he thought about trying to live a life like St. Francis, he felt some consolation, a sense of fulfillment. So for months he had this interior conflict going on with what he should do when he started feeling better. And he ultimately decided to go further in the faith, get more educated in the faith through theology degrees, and then uh, become ordained, start the Jesuits, and uh, lead a life of uh, faith. So he's a great saint. And that examine of conscience right there is really straight from St. Ignatius of Loyola and uh, kind of exploring that consolation, desolation uh, within us and making uh, decisions, especially uh, bigger ones. So it never hurts to be like, I'm going to just uh, take a moment and think about this. Unlike me, where like boss calls me, like, you want to move to Atlanta? I'm like, sure. You need to think about it? No. Does that uh, make a lot of sense in life? I wasn't married, though, so, you know, it didn't matter. But uh, it's kind of stupid to do things that way. Had a good experience down there. But anyway, we haven't learned. Um, so anyway, we're going to go in the church and go meet with your children.